All right. Good afternoon. I was giving the, given the topic, Current Issues in Old Testament Studies, and you'll see what I did with it. My task is to provide an overview of some of the current issues in Old Testament studies. Please be aware that like all fields, all of our fields, Old Testament studies is highly specialized, and we enjoy using obscure terminology and funny scripts. My hope is to make this talk as accessible as possible, but we're going to get into some of the important details. Here's a suggestion. Look around. Identify an Old Testament-looking person. They typically have thick glasses, long beards, or tangled hair, mismatched socks, and are anxiously trying to avoid eye contact right now. <laughs> Once you've located that person, whisper your questions to them or corner them afterwards for a detailed lecture on the spelling of a particular word or a connection between two seemingly disparate texts. For those of you who are still here, who have not suddenly realized they meant to be at a different lecture across campus, I'd like to situate the field of Old Testament studies a bit for you. We can think about the various subfields of Old Testament studies within this rubric. In many ways, the field is situated around translating an ancient text into a modern world. The dotted line here separates the ancient from the modern. While it's tempting to think about these as completely divergent, the reality is that none of these areas is completely independent, and each one bleeds into the others. My personal areas of interest and expertise, if I have any, focus on the top half of the circle. These approaches can be described as evaluating the Old Testament in light of its ancient environment. So looking at historical, linguistic, uh, textual, archaeological, and other various comparative approaches. As we look through each of these approaches, we see that the object of our study is slightly, in slightly different colors. Further, our understanding of the ancient and the modern world is colored according to what lens we're using to investigate and the questions that we bring to that text. Because our time is limited, and I don't merely want to handle things in only a summary fashion, I like to focus our discussion on an issue that all of us have an interest in and one that is terribly important in Old Testament studies right now. Particularly, we will look through the lens of various textual and linguistic studies to the Old Testament. Our question today is quite simple, and it's one that continues to plague Old Testament scholarship. And the question is just this. What is the text of the Hebrew Bible? What is the text of the Hebrew Bible? While it's a modest question, the answer is definitely not clear-cut. And, like Alice's rabbit hole, in just a moment we might go down it, but never once considering how in the world we were to get out of it again. The central question, central questions following these approaches are just this. How did ancient scribes collect, copy, and construct the biblical materials? And a second question what is the relationship between multiple contemporaneous editions of those biblical materials? You can see how these questions overlap with many other areas I've outlined previously. But as proof that this is an issue, let's look at two quick examples. First, the translation of Psalm 2216 in the CSB, this is all good Baptist, reads, They pierced my hands and my feet. As good PhD students, you know that you must read all the footnotes, exactly. And when you casually click on the large A there, you find yourself in free fall. <laughs> some manuscripts, some Hebrew manuscripts, I'm translating this note, by the way. Some Hebrew manuscripts, the Septuagint, Syriac, read pierced, while other Hebrew manuscripts read like a lion are my hands and my feet, like a lion are my hands and my feet. Assuming that you decoded all the abbreviations, you're left with so many unanswered questions. Why is this note here? What Hebrew manuscripts are better? They happen in both places, notice. Which ones are more accurate? What does a lion have to do with my hands and my feet? And what do I do next? Few answers are found in this 13-word 
Second proof is an email I received two days ago, dated Monday, October 28th, 2019, an international conference discussing the question, what is the text of the Hebrew Bible? It's almost like I planned that. Described further as, this question as, one of the most complex, but also fundamental epistemological issues that we're facing today. So, what's our goal? What's my goal? Well, to be upfront with you, we're not going to solve this big question. We're not going to solve it this morning, or even this afternoon now that we're past noon. However, I would like to provide you an overview of the textual nature of the Hebrew Bible and focus on developments in recent scholarship and think about them in the context of the last few decades. Let's start with a basic question. What is the Bible? What is the Bible? Now, if you feel a trap coming, (laughs) you're tracking with me. Most people would describe the Bible as either an object or by particular content. The object is a book, and the content includes particular written words. Yes? Seems straightforward, right? These categories of object and content are quite fuzzy, though, because is the object a physical book? Well, which form of the physical book? How many pages does it have? What about an electronic book? Is that also a Bible? As for the content, what do we do with various translations? What about Bibles in different languages? Those are different written words, right? Does the order or the arrangement matter? What about a a subset of the whole? Does the Gideon New Testament Psalms Bible Is that a Bible? What content? What content? Some of my New Testament faculty said that's the only Bible, right? (laughs) What content in the study Bible edition, what content in the study Bible edition that you own is the Bible? Well, my Bible says this. What about the book titles, the verse numbers, the page numbers, the section headings, punctuation, Paragraph layout, spelling, pronunciation. What's the content of the Bible? All of these varieties and variations in object and content point out that the Bible is not just one thing. And yet, we can still identify what it is and what it is not. In a room of such well-educated theologians, you would be sure to get the quote-unquote right answer to what is the Bible. In a room such as this, someone would probably give us the right answer as what? Well, maybe something like the scrolls of papyrus and parchment of the Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, 27 books in the New Testament and 39 books of the Old Testament. Right? That's the right answer, yes, if someone asks you. Maybe you haven't felt this before. (laughs) But let's be honest. In giving this answer, we have just played a magic trick. Because we've radically shifted the physical and functional conception of what the Bible is as object, and we've realigned the content to the realm of specialist. Nothing like ending a discussion in that way. Oh, it's their problem. It is right to think about the Bible as an antiquarian object. But if that is the case, we need to allow the ancients to define its properties. The physicality of the writing varies from single papyrus sheet to longer single-sided sewn scrolls to double-sided codices. The physicality is different, but yet it's all Bible. The verbal function of these documents was inseparable from their physical nature in the ancient world. Writing was encoded speech. Normal reading was oral, ritual, 
and public. Oral, ritual, and public. Most people engage the scriptures through hearing rather than seeing, in community rather than individualistically, and in sacred time rather than mundane times. This is radically different than how we engage the Bible today. What's more, reading was recitation. Reading was recitation. There is no word for silent reading, as you will know. While we consider print in our time as paramount, many ancient communities elevated the traditional oral presentation as primary. The reading is the fusion. In reading, we fuse object with content. In reading, we fuse object and content. Such may be seen when we look at the Masoretic academics who encoded their reading tradition into their ancient continental text. These vows and cantillations preserve their sacred interpretation even when it altered clear readings of written text. A great example of this, and there are many, is from Ruth 1.8. The Tiberian scribe of the Ben Asher family indicated the difference in what was written and what was read. You can see it nice and big there, the third line down. Lake na, shov na, isha la beit imu, oh, excuse me, ima. And then here's the word, ya'atz adonai, ima kim chesed, right? May. So this is Ruth speaking to her daughters-in-law. May Yahweh do hesed with you. But notice the text clearly, the written text clearly says, Yahseh Adonai Imakim hesed. Yahweh will do hesed to you. Or y'all, for these southerners. See, the reading in some ways superseded the written. Uh, you can see it a little bit bigger here if you... I love this screen. I need this in my office. So, <laughs> All this brings us back to the question, what is the text of the Bible? Or, reframed in light of these historical realities, what are the sources from which the Bible is derived? What are the written sources from which the Bible is derived? Again, the well-informed answer is that the source of the Hebrew Bible is the... Masoretic text is the Masoretic text, or MT, to just be short. Okay, so yay, you got the answer right. But we found ourselves in another trap, have we not? Another trap is here. The reason why is that actually there isn't such a thing as a Masoretic text, it doesn't exist as an object. There is not one manuscript that is the MT. Rather, the MT is an amalgamation of multiple different manuscripts. This complicates our easy answers. Nothing like looking at manuscripts to complicate your easy answers. We shall come back to the text in a moment, but let's just consider a few other issues concerning these different manuscripts. One of those, and scholars like to make a deal, big deal of this, is that we point out that the books, that the order of the books in the Old Testament, in our Old Testament, does not follow the Hebrew order. As you well know, the order of the English Old Testament was inherited from German's, Luther's German edition, or maybe the Vulgate, or going back to the Septuagint. Here's the secret, though. There actually isn't a unified order of the Hebrew manuscripts either. We think about the threefold division, but the order within those are variable. In fact, the last page of B19A, which is a very important manuscript, which you see on the screen here, this is the last page. And if you uh, know your Hebrew text, you can see it ends with um, La Tova, which is the last word of the book of Nehemiah. Whereas our printed edition of this text ends with the book of, you guys know, Chronicles. In the sort of book of Chronicles. While Luther kept the Vulgate old order, he insisted on using the Hebrew text to translate. 
as a good humanist. The Hebrew Bible and the other English, or, sorry, he and the other English translators, translators of the Hebrew Bible employed was the suburb second rabbinic Bible, what's called the Blomberg Bible. And here's a picture of the first page of that Bible. But what they did not include, if you notice, is the material all around the Hebrew text, the commentary, the translation, or the Masoretic notes. As you can see, there's actually only the one verse of the Bible on this entire page. So you have the title, which is big. Around it, it's a beautiful uh, sort of engraving. And then on the column on the right, you see Barah, Elohim, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So only one verse on this entire page, and everything else is commentary notes. Luther translates the Bible, <laughs> but does not translate these notes. So, what then is the Masoretic text? So if the Bible is the Masoretic text, but the Masoretic text doesn't exist, what's the Masoretic text? What are we talking about? Well, over a century ago, Rudolf Kittel began assembling the biblical Hebraic Hebraic editions of the Bible. He started putting these in print. The first two were based on the Bomberg, Bomberg Bible, which I just showed you an image of. And once the images became available of the famous B19A text, or what was called the Leningrad Codex, he switched to a diplomatic approach. He's going to uh, have his Bible represent a single text, that is, the Leningrad Codex. So this codex, the Leningrad Codex, is the oldest complete Hebrew manuscript. Here's a picture of it right here uh, that you're seeing on the screen. And it's originally copied in Tiberias around 1008 AD by a family of scribes who were called the Ben Asher family. The third edition of, of Kittel's volume, Biblical Hebraica, um, was not a near exact copy of this one text, although he did not repl replicate the Masoretic text. Notes as around the text. Excuse me. The fourth edition, Bi Biblical Hebraica Stukartensi, or BHS as we call it, continued this approach and updated the Masoretic and modern text critical notes. Seven of the 20 planned volumes of the fifth edition, Quinta, Biblical Hebraica Quinta, are now complete. And the idea is that that will be out in within a few years from now. When finished, BHQ, the fifth edition, will finally realize a full printed edition of the Leningrad Codex. But having said that, B19A is not the Masoretic text. The 90s and early 2000s saw the publication of three Hebrew Union, or excuse me, Hebrew University Bible Project volumes of an edition of an earlier text from the 900s, almost 100 years old, older than the Leningrad Codex, which is called the Aleppo Codex. The manuscript's a better copy of the Masoretic text, but it is missing most of the Torah. The lost portions, in the lost portions, B19A is used in these volumes. While both of these manuscripts are exceptional copies, by the way, this is a, a, an image of the... Um, um, of the Aleppo Codex here. While both of these manuscripts are exceptional copies, neither is an exact representation of the MT tradition. This fact is demonstrated by comparing the various textual notes and the Tiberian treatises on the text. So the reason why we know these texts aren't the Masoretic texts is because if you look at the notes around the outside, they, they note forms that are actually different than what they have in the text. So it seems like the outside notes have their own tradition and they get copied in, and they don't always match the text you see. So you see we're going back to some earlier texts that we don't have. Additionally, a comparison of these early Tiberian manuscripts to other texts, particularly those from the medieval archive of thousands of texts from the, from the Geniza at Cairo Fusat, shows that the Tiberian vocalization is only one of several recitation traditions that were in use during the late medieval period. But still, no single MT manuscript has thus far come to light. The MT tradition of text, though, is a terribly important tradition and a very ancient biblical source. Let me show you by using this example. This is the Ashkar Gilson manuscript, or a page from the Ashkar Gilson manuscript. Actually, this page is actually at the Duke Library, just up the road a little ways. So the Ashkar Gilson manuscript is a Torah scroll dated to the 7th century A.D., 
7th century AD. Even though we only have a handful of these sheets, and by the way, like three more were discovered in the Cairo Geniza um, uh, library in uh, Housen at Cambridge recently, or beginning part of this year, actually. Even though we have only a handful of these sheets, they demonstrate the importance of not just the preservation of the consul text, but also, listen to this, its pagination and its formatting arrangement. Uh, this is intriguing. So, 7th century Masoretic text, unvocalized, by the way. But look at this with me. If we compare Ashkar Gilson to the Bologna Torah scroll from 500 years later, so into the, well into the medieval time, even if you can't read this text, by the way, this is the Song of the Sea from Exodus, you will notice the arrangement on the page. Does everyone see it? Even if you've forgotten every Hebrew letter, you know. <laughs> or never knew one. Five lines of text begin the column. You see the five lines at the top? Exact same five lines. Then the poetic section, which is broken down into the same format, which is called a brick over brick. So think about like a bricklayer lays bricks in alternating fashion. This arrangement actually is specified by the Talmud. A comparison with the Leningrad Codex demonstrates that the same five lines were also followed by the same poetic format for the Leningrad Codex. So now we're talking three to 400 years after the Ashkar and Gilson text. Exact same format. Now, if we go earlier in time, however, the Dead Sea Scrolls do not witness this format. You can see that at the end of the song, the sea, Dead Sea Scrolls on the right, Ashkar Gilson's on the left, um, you can see that at the end of the song of the sea, the, Masoret, the, excuse me, the Qumran manuscript is not following the rigid format that we saw with the MT. Yet, the text itself is still similar. In fact, we call these early texts that are so similar something like the proto-Masoretic text or a Masoretic text like manuscripts. All right, but yet... The Dead Sea Scroll time would be actually before the Masoretic text time frame. So it's a bit anachronistic. So let me sum it all up for us where we're at right now. Okay, this is where we're at. It's kind of complicated, but, uh, you know, again, simplified. <laughs> this diagram shows what we know <laughs> of the source of the MT Bible. So track with me just really quickly from the right to left. The proto-MT, which goes back into the Dead Sea Scroll time. I've got a nice little timeline there at the bottom, very specific. That gets copied into what we think of as the Masoretic text tradition, which is then pervade in the medieval time. Ashkar Gilson is one of these texts that comes from this. At some point, that text then gets taken over by the Ben Asher family, who put all the dots and the swiggles and all the things that are confusing into the text tradition. From that, our two earliest witnesses are the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad B19A Codex, which is what BHS comes from. And that produces the Biblical Hebraica, and the translation of that is, of course, uh, only uh, in JPS English is a, is a translation of that text specifically. The Hebrew Union Bible Project is the one that's kind of offshoot that's trying to take the main text as Aleppo and somewhat of the text as Leningrad. Okay, so this is what we know. Notice that there's dotted lines and all these sorts of things. I try to make solid the things that we actually know some dependence here. Now, we could also examine and situate the situation of the earliest Greek translations of the Old Testament in this. Its complicated history would take about 30 times as long to describe to you as that of the MT. And if you think I'm kidding, I'm not. There's a whole class on it I met a couple weeks ago. And again, you can find that Old Testament friend and talk all about it. So. But to sum it all up, here's what we're looking at. Old Testament scholars a century ago we're left with two major textual traditions. One followed what we, call, what we call the MT tradition, the Masoretic text tradition, while the other one followed the ancient Greek tradition, or what we might call the Proto-Septuagint tradition. Other translations typically fell into one camp or the other. So you say, what about all the other translations? Well, the Syriac, the Vulgate, and the Targums followed the Hebrew. The Old Latin, the Slavic, the Armenian, the Georgian, and the Coptic, and I think the Arabic as well, all follow the Greek text. While many texts were compatible, many of the texts within the text were compatible, differences were difficult to assess, right? You only have two streams of information, so when they differ, what do you do? 
the options were limited, and you either had directional reliance or you could claim translational differences. That's basically all you had. The MT was typical, was typically given the preference because it was written in Hebrew. Right? And if you got to pre give preference to one, that would make the most sense. But in many of these cases, the Greek widely differed from the Hebrew, and any genetic connection was speculative at best. What is the relationship between these two text streams? All of this changed in the middle of the 20th century. Now we're coming up to date. The discoveries between 1947 and 1956 in the Judean desert challenged the scholarly paradigms. But the full impact of the Dead Sea Scrolls is still outstanding. We're still dealing with it. The last publication of the Dead Sea Scroll was not completed until 2011. Let me say that again. The last publication was not completed until 2011, a mere eight years ago. And the biblical materials have only been available in full since the early 2000s. So less than two decades of scholars thinking about this. So what do the Dead Sea Scrolls do for us? Well, first, they challenge traditional notions of the development of the, Hebrew, of the text of the Hebrew Bible. Both the highly conservative opinions and the highly eclectic approaches both failed in light of this new revealed evidence. So those people that just said the Masoretic text is all there is, it's the best, and everything should be traced back to it. Dead Sea Scroll does not show that. And those who said, no, we need to do a mishmash of all these texts, Dead Sea Scrolls don't support that either. <laughs> it actually made life much more complicated. Second, the evidence, uh, the Dead Sea Scroll evidence Hebrew text, similar in form, and to a lesser degree, the reading tradition of the MT, or what we call the proto-MT. So what we see is that the MT text was archaic. It did go back to earlier uh, text types. But what we saw in those texts is that linguistic variation was apparent and even traceable within those texts. MT, the MT reading tradition, the dots and the swiggles and how it was read, was ancient, but also it was itself eclectic. Not everyone agreed on this tradition. Thirdly, we can say the Dead Sea Scrolls evidence Hebrew texts similar to the Greek Septuagint tradition. So, in other words, you can't just say it's Greek versus Hebrew. We like Hebrew better, so we're going Hebrew. It doesn't work that way anymore because many of the Greek traditions are witnessed now in a Hebrew version. Uh, what am I up to? Four? Four, as we see that the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal multiple editions of several books. Rephrase. Let's say it again. Multiple editions of several books. So there is not one single order of the Psalms at, at, at Qumran. There are multiple orders of the Psalms. There are multiple versions of the book of Samuel. Samuel is a classic version of all these text critical problems. Multiple versions of the book of Samuel. Jeremiah is the one that many people know about. There's a long and a short version. Ezekiel also has significant ordering differences. At the end of the day, what we do is we, we talk about the word pluriformity. And if you're interested in more in thinking about pluriformity, textual pluriformity, you can look at the nice bibliography that Rob Coleman assembled for us that's in your little packet there to think more about that. And then lastly, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time together on, is that Dead Sea Scrolls demonstrate scribal preservation, scribal variation, and scribal creativity. Scribal preservation, scribal variation, and scribal creativity. Now, we've already talked about scribal preservation. I showed you the Song of the Sea, how it was nearly identical to what we see in these medieval texts. So I'm not going to continue to talk about this. What we know is that the, the, the Masoretic text goes back as early as the Dead Sea Scrolls, if not before. But the situation at that time was not uniquely following the Masoretic text. Let's look at it, some examples of this. Let's think about scribal variation first. Okay, here we go. So, um, so this is the uh, 4Q47, which is a, a fragment of Joshua. So um, you guys know in New Testament scholarship, there's this passage, John 8, that sort of floats around. It's found in different places in the Gospels. It shows them in Luke for some reason at one point in time. You can talk to the New Testament guys about why that is. But what we see is there's a similar thing that happens with the end of Joshua chapter 8. 
verses 30 through 35. And what you're seeing in front of you is the last two verses of that, verses 34 and 35. It's the top of a column, so we have 34 that ends, the last word there, and then 35 continues on. And then immediately after this is a full text of the book of Joshua, we suppose. All right, But the verse that follows it is actually um, Joshua 5, 2. So what we see is that this passage from, that we know of in the Masoretic text from the end of Joshua chapter 8. By the way, this is the passage that talks about the covenant renewal at Ebal and Gerizim. If you were here for Mr. Sandy Richter's talk earlier, she talked about this passage. Is that It looks like some, at least this early manuscript, takes that passage and puts it down after Joshua 5.2. Now, we don't really know the reasons why it's there or why it's where it's at in our Bibles, but you could potentially see it after Joshua 5.1 as a response to this summary section. If you remember, 5.1 ends this narrative about the destruction of the city, and then we have this summation, and then the very next thing is the circumcision ritual in 5.2. And so if if you have this text and you know you want to put it in somewhere, that's a perfect place to put it in, right? Covenant renewal. And what follows covenant renewal? Circumcision, right? Obviously, these two things go together. Uh, Where we know it, we see it in in chapter 8. It follows the sin of Achan. Another nice spot for it in some ways. Theologically, we can see how the sin of Achan is seen as the insider of insider is really shown to be an outsider. So what do we do? We don't really know who's in, who's out. And so now we have the covenant renewal. But yet... To do that, in that place, in chapter 8, you have to have Israel moving, historically, 20 miles to the north, near Shechem, into Canaanite land in order to do this. Is that the best place for this? And this motivates some of these issues. Uh, We also see a different arrangement as well in the Septuagint. And so here's a copy of, I think it's Ralph's Septuagint. And we see here that these verses, Joshua 30 through 35, are found between... Joshua 9.2 and 9.3, potentially as a response to the gathering of enemies in chapter 2. All right, so we see this floating text. All right, so, so we see scribal preservation at the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see scribal variation of this type and others in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the last one I will look at is actually where we're going to go to your handout here, if you aren't too scared by that. There's an English sheet, the second one, for those of you guys that would rather look at that. But the third one is we need to look at scribal creativity. Can scribes be creative? (laughs) Well, that would be seen as a bad thing, right? But not always. So we're looking at the text from Exodus 20 and Exodus uh, 5, or excuse me, and and Deuteronomy 5. And this on the screen is 4Q41, uh, labeled 4Q Deuteronomy N, for those of you guys who are keeping score in the back. All right. For Q Deuteronomy in. Now, by that designation, you think, oh, this must be a biblical scroll, right? But notice, it is, and it isn't. It's a creative biblical scroll. <laughs> okay? So, what are these texts? Well, hopefully everyone knows. Exodus 5, or excuse me, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. What is the commonality? The Decalogue, right? The Decalogue. But, also, as you know, the Decalogue is not the same in Exodus and Deuteronomy, right? Particularly, where's the major difference between the two? You remember? In the command, the reason for the commandment, the Sabbath commandment, that's where the major difference happens, right? Remember, in Exodus, one reason is given, and in Deuteronomy, a different reason is given. The, same, the commandment is, is nearly identical in both, although there is a word difference we're going to see. But nonetheless, the reason for why you keep the Sabbath is different. Is the reason because the Lord created the world in seven days and therefore rested on the seventh? Yes. Or is the reason why you were slaves in Egypt and you didn't get a rest and so you should allow your slaves to rest? Yes. And so this scribe, the scribe of 4Q41, understood something about the commandments. And in rabbinic tradition, God speaks to Moses all in one word. It's very interesting. And God spoke these words. The rabbi said they were all spoken at once, and then God circles back around and gives each one individually. It's a very interesting tradition. And so what we see is that these scribes, 
being creative with their interpretation, understanding what they inherited, and then saying, you know what? Maybe there's a way we can bring these two texts together. Maybe we can get back to what actually God said on the mountain. (laughs) And so they fuse these two texts together in an amazingly creative way. So let's look at it together. And if you want to look at the English version, that's fine. You can look at the Hebrew later in your own time. What you see on line 9, which I have outlined here, is you see that one word connects the Exodus 20 passage, or actually it's three or four words, with the Deuteronomy 5 passage. Again, the commandment here is either remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, according to Exodus, or guard, shamar, shamar, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, so you have these different commands, which overlap, obviously, but then you have this this phrase, the Sabbath day, and then to keep it holy. Does everyone see it on the sheet? I've given it parallel to you. Try to make this as easy as possible. You can look up here as well if you want to. (laughs) Okay, it's the one to keep it holy is boxed right there, to keep it holy. All right, what's going to happen is that the scribe is going to be copying Deuteronomy, because that's his base text here. Before this, the columns before it talks about Deuteronomy. He's going to get to make it holy, and he's going to give the reason why, according to Deuteronomy. And then, not to leave out any details of Scripture, he's going to circle back around to make it holy from Exodus and give that reason, and then join it back up at the end. Okay, very intriguing here. So, again, you can see that the, the layout here. You can see also that hardly a word is different from one to the other text, right? So to make it holy, as the Lord God commands you, that falls in Deuteronomy. And then we have overlapping text. You are to labor six days and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord. Do not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male, your female slave, your ox, your donkey. Flip over. Any of your livestock, the resident alien, immigrant who lives within your city walls, so that your male and female slaves may rest as you do. Then, remember, this is unique to Deuteronomy here, that you were a slave in Egypt. See the reason? And the Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand and outstretched arm, challenging the power of the Pharaoh. And then there's a summary remark at the end of Deuteronomy. Thus, the Lord your God has commanded you what? to keep, to guard the Sabbath day. You see, it comes full circle back around to the same language, similar forms, similar words, and the scribe just keeps going to make it holy. You see, and then he inserts in the Exodus passage, for the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in seven, six, excuse me, in six days, and then he rests on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day to make it holy, and then we jump right back in to the following commandment honor your father and mother. Do you see the textual creativity? Do you see the beauty of these things? Do you see why the ancient scribe may have brought these things together to answer a question that he had about what was going on on Sinai? 4Q41. By the way, there's also a, uh, another uh, uh, papyrus of this uh, which we call the Nash papyri. And it does exactly the same thing, except for it flips the reasons. It actually gives the Exodus reason first and then the Deuteronomy reason. But it actually uses the same type of, of combination of text. So, where does this leave us? Seventy years after the discovery in, this, in the caves, proximate to Kirbet Qumran, and throughout the Judean desert, the Dead Sea Scrolls captivate the imagination of the popular and academic audiences. Scholars continue to identify the problems the Dead Sea Scrolls create for established notions of the composition and compilation of the biblical canon. It would seem that we are at the forefront of a Kunian paradigm shift in our conception of ancient text. These discoveries continue to rewrite our conceptions of ancient literary production. How ancient scribes and ancient texts were created and preserve do not follow modern notions of printed text or digital and electronic works. While anachronisms are unavoidable at times, we should be careful not to, de- to demand of ancient writings our notions of text and publication. But 
we should also be careful to assume too much about the functions of these multifaceted texts. We simply do not know the way these ancient communities viewed this diverse literary material. Just as we find a wide variety of Bibles and biblical materials in our churches and on any, on any given Sunday, the understanding of those texts, what they mean to our congregants, is likewise quite diverse, isn't it? The posse of evidence, the unknown origins of these texts, and the debated use of many of them obscure even the nature of the basic sectarian groups in the Second Temple Judaism. The interpretations of these writings and the connections to other writings uh, within these communities is still an open issue. But what we can say is that the material looks something like this. From Qumran, we have a large group of texts which we could consider proto-Masoretic. But we also have texts that are, to a lesser degree, aligned with other types of text. So, what does all this tell us? What do we do with all this? Well, let me just suggest that we first reevaluate our own understandings of the Hebrew text in light of the complexity of its history. Right? We can't demand of it something that it is not. Second is that we should consider how the text should be understood and how it should be understood as an eclectic unit. Maybe the Hebrew Bible is more like the NA28, the New Testament eclectic text, than it is the uh, Masoretic text as we've seen it before. In fact, there is a project called the Hebrew Bible uh, Critical Edition, which is there on the right. There's only one volume out that is attempting to bring these notions of eclectic text into um, a, a, a single Hebrew volume. And last, we should, we should say with gratitude and praise of a God who chose to enter into a messy and complicated and complex world, thanks. He promises that his word is true. It will last for all time. And he preserves his people and his word for eternity. We can be thankful for that. By the way, the last word here is that um, all of these Bible translations use some type of eclectic text. But yet we don't have an agreed upon Hebrew eclectic text. So in some way, each of these translations that we all are using, we know we're the right one to use, right? The ones that we're all using are using some type of eclectic text, a combination of Greek. Right? How many times do you read the Bible and you see a note and it says, the Greek reads this way, right? And so, but yet, let me just warn you, scholars have still not yet decided all the details there. There's not great agreement across the board. Last thing is a, is a resource here. Uh, from some of our friends, uh, Peter Gurry and John Mead, who was here a couple years ago um, on campus, and they've created uh, what they call the Text and Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary, and it's an excellent resource if you're interested. They were just up the road in Henderson a few weeks ago doing a conference talking about some of these issues and how to deal with them. So if you're interested more in that, uh, we can get you those resources or you can follow up with their stuff online. How do we take this information and use it in our churches and, and think about this with all right, well, that's uh, 45 minutes, 46 minutes on the nose. Maybe we might have some questions. It's, uh, thank you for your presentation. A two-part question. In terms of, of the, the English text that we read, what percentage of the verses are in some way distributed? There, there's some, some data about them from these studies. And has the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls increased or decreased the number of dubious verses? Um, boy, I don't have a percentage off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I guess you just do a survey of any single page. But in my experience in reading my English Bible, there's rarely a page goes by without me seeing a note. Yeah. yeah. So whatever percentage that would be. So... Uh, and again, you got to you know specify you know number and weight, right? So we also obviously have to be careful about that, right? So if I give you a percentage, that might be a percentage based on number, but what am I numbering? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also a percentage based on weight would say something different, like how much, how many of these differences are meaningful differences, right? And that's yeah. the significance. That that's a different that's a different question. Many times, what we see is that we see the ancient uh, scribes 
or maybe the ancient translators, which uh, I actually talked to John Mead yesterday on the phone, and he said to me that the ancient translators actually were called interpreters mm -hmm. in Latin. That was actually the word they used, not translator, interpreter, right? Because mm -hmm. they So the ancient interpreters, um, you know, are by their very nature creating a modern understanding of an ancient text, right? So that by nature, there ha there's a transformation that happens from ancient to more modern. And so they have to say something that's understandable, right? They don't just, when you, get, when you hit a hard part, they don't just like transcribe the Hebrew and keep moving on, right? right. They actually give you something, right? And those are typically the questions. So, um, and in some ways, the scrolls help us with that, at least seeing that, uh, that many times the translators are working from, um, from a variety of different uh, inputs to come up with those answers. They're not just like creating them on the spot, yeah. if I could say that. Dr. Hardy, fabulous, fabulous presentation, and uh, really, really seriously delightful uh, to, to see both uh, the uh, information that you're going into and the way you present it. Just really stupendous. Uh, I'm wondering if you would comment. I have a couple different lines of questions here. One, just pretty simple, is uh, how would you articulate a view of the autographs in view of this information? Uh, you know, a second one yeah. that you can comment on is uh, just, um, would you say anything about modernity's um, proposal of, uh, of an autograph in relationship to this um, ancient evidence? Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, obviously um, an autograph isn't merely a modernistic understanding, right? <laughs> There's some origin point for all of these things, right? The question is, what did that origin point look like? So, for instance, if we said the origin point of the book of Ezekiel was the preaching of Ezekiel, right, um, then who actually wrote down the preaching of Ezekiel, right? And then who arranged it into books, into a book, right? And then, you know, all these sorts of things. So, so it depends a little bit on what you mean by autograph. Are we going to trace that to the, you know, the spoken word of the prophet? That's always a question, right? Or to the original writing or the original full composition, but what, let me just say that, so, so in one sense, the idea of autograph is not a bad idea, um, but we have to be careful about what we mean by autograph, right? Um, and the other thing I want to say is that none of the Dead Sea Scroll evidence is actually autographs, <laughs> right? Which I know you know, but it's also very good. We're talking about some later formulation of this, right? So by the time the Dead Sea Scrolls come around, uh, I mean, it's a wide section of time, but, but these, these scrolls have all been around for a little while. And, and been in production. So, uh, so we're actually trying to deal with things somewhat after the autographs. So, so the reality is, is we don't really know what to do with all the differences at that stage. Might as well take another three or four steps back and think, okay, now what does that then get us right back to here? So I would say it's still an open question, but I don't think it's a uh, question that we, we want to avoid completely, especially since you know, many of our statements of what scripture is go back to what an autograph is, right? Even if that notion is maybe a, a bit um, um, cloudy in places, right? But it doesn't mean that we can't keep thinking about it and keep looking at the evidence and seeing what we can say about those uh, original situations of textuality. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, better chip. <laughs> Older chip. <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned since Qumran, we've got a, we've got different uh, traditions: Proto-Masoretic, Proto-Samaritan, uh, Proto-LXX, mm -hmm. right. and then the other. Uh, there's a, you read different statistics as far as the uh, proportion. Uh, what is your thinking on that? Right, I, you know, and we think of, uh, I think the, you know, Emmanuel Tove is sort of the, um, you know, the father of fathers here. Um, the prophet of prophets when we come to this, he's the, he's the one that in many ways edited many of these documents and has been thinking about them the longest because most of us have only had access to the full, like I mentioned, for the last maybe a few decades at most. Um, and he's given certain s statistics as to which documents from the Dead Sea, which biblical documents from the Dead Sea Scrolls f fall into each category. Okay. 
Okay, and again, as I mentioned before, his statistics give the Proto MT the large major not not the large majority, but they have the majority of text. I don't remember exactly uh, what the numbers is. Maybe you remember? Do you remember what he gives? The latest is forty for the Mesoamerican. Forty. That's what I was thinking. Right, right. So, uh, so it's still a minority share, but it's the largest of what's out there. So, but some some things to consider. Um, you know, if he's looking at 4Q Deuteronomy N, is this a Masoretic text or is it not? Well, as you saw on your on your handout, I mean, I think there's like one letter difference in the actual text, and it's a clearly a mistake. He says, My, "Your daughter, your daughter," instead of "Your son or your daughter." Um, and so, is that a proto is that a proto Masoretic text? He would say no. Because he's thinking proto masoretic as the, the sheet of paper that, you know, that has these constant texts. I would say, no, this evidences a proto masoretic text type. It's just a creative one, right? We don't know that this, this is actually a full Deuteronomy scroll. We don't know much about what the use of this thing is. That's my caution here at the end. And so, um, so I would say the actual number of texts that follow the MT is actually quite a bit higher. Uh, classic example is, uh, another classic example is 1Q Isaiah B, so not the great Isaiah scroll, but the other one, which he claims is a proto-Masoretic text, but 1Q Isaiah A, which is ext looks extremely like, like the Masoretic text, extremely close to the Masoretic text, he actually says is non-aligned because the spelling is different. So again, it all goes back to what you think of as what this Masoretic text is, and then how those developments and what the scribes can do to allow on those edges, right? So, so, so I, I'm a little cautious. I, I like that the majority of the text he calls them has rhetoric, but I actually think the number is probably quite a bit higher. Um, now, the problem is, though, of course, that as soon as we have any other text or something different, which we do, we still have these questions to ask, right? Even if the majority are Masoretic, we still have to say, what do we do with these texts that follow the other, these other traditions? So. And what is your thinking regarding what Tov seems to be saying, that there was very a very relaxed attitude as far as acceptance so that we shouldn't try to focus on any one particular proto-Masoretic or proto-Septuagint, that, that uh, Judaism was accepting of these right. until the destruction of the temple? Right, right. I, I hope that you heard in my presentation, at least at the end, that I would be extremely cautious of so that kind of thinking. Um, we don't really know fully the sectarian, under, uh, the sectarian relationship between the groups of Judaisms in the first century, right? I mean, even the New Testament, we see the Sadducees debating with the Pharisees and Jesus saying, oh, the Sadducees don't believe this and they only take the Torah, you know, and so we see these relationships already, and these differences sort of fragmenting, right, uh, even in the evidences that we have. And so what we don't know is what these texts were doing side by side. We know they exist, but are they equally authoritative for these groups and these communities? Are they being, is this library a gathering of different sources, or is it one group's production, right? And, and I think scroll scholarship has moved away from seeing the scrolls as all produced in one place in this desert and see it more as a uh, conglomeration of, um, of a broader Jewish library. So these scrolls are coming from different places. So I think that complicates their reality as well. So I'd be cautious of, of making the conclusion to just say, oh, they didn't really care. Because they clearly cared. Otherwise, you, you don't copy a scroll exactly, <laughs> constantly, right, for hundreds and thousand years if you don't care that much about it, right? So, so someone does care. Yeah, good. Oh, great, Kristen. Um, so... In this room, I would imagine, we're relatively comfortable with some parts of this conversation. Like, I don't think any of us are like shocked that this is happening. But for people in our churches who are kind of reading these footnotes in their study Bibles, I would imagine you have people who approach you kind of at the lay level who aren't familiar with this, who are like, what do I do? I'm curious how you answer that question, especially for us as we kind of get those questions in our own churches. Right, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I like to, um, I think that that question can emanate from several different Places of um, of sort of discombo uh, sort of like mental uneasiness, right? So some of it can be on a personal level, sort of. I I, I thought the Bible was this pristine thing, and you're telling me that it, that words can be spelled differently, right? And some people just can't even handle that, and so that's one side of it. Okay, 
Um, but there's another side of it too, which I, I think, which is the most of our people aren't actually so worried about that. They realize the Bible is human and divine, right? Uh, there are more, and they know that God preserves His Word. They're clear on that, and they see the faithfulness by which these communities took and took and the seriousness with they took. So they don't have really that problem. To me, most of the time, the questions emanate from, "Oh, I heard on the internet." About this problem or that thing or the uh, or, or the hidden the hidden books or the the parts that were taken out because they were whatever right and that's normally what people come at from these and what I like to say actually quite simply not to give a simple answer but to give something to hang our hats on is this if you open up any modern version of the Bible and you go to you know the end of the book of Mark or Psalm twenty two sixteen there's a note right there. Nothing is being hidden. The translators are being faithful in what they said. They may be inconsistent in places, and us scholars and eggheads might debate. And, I mean, we have to do that. We have to make money doing something, right? We have to justify our importance, right? But at the end of the day, for the most part, the text is right there. In, front, in the translation, it says these difficulties. It's all right there. We're not trying to hide anything. Things are bracketed out. Things are labeled. And so, you know, this, this sort of like a conspiracy idea of the hidden Bible is one that uh, doesn't really work very well when you actually look at what we have in front of us. So I think we can, we can and this maybe goes back to uh, Dr. Hammond's question, I, I think we can look at the text we have, even in English translations, reading the notes, and we can see, hey, okay, here are the things that are, are differing, right? And we can make an assessment ourselves, right, about how important these are, where the, these come at very important points, or maybe what we think of as less important points, um, all of God's words are important, but you, you still some things seem to have higher standard meaning. And so I think that's the thing I like to point people to and say, you know, let's, let's look at this together. Let's look at this and let's talk about these different categories and let's understand what these notes are, are saying to us. And even if you can't assess whether Psalm 2216 said, he, they pierced my hands inside, or like a lion are my hands inside, you can at least know that both are there. And you can kind of assess it. By the way, in that instance in particular, there are two Qumran texts that read, they pierced my hands inside. So that's probably the reason why most of the translators keep that version. And, of course, we know it from the New Testament as well. Right? So it's an interesting question. Thanks for that.